Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good afternoon and welcome. Um, I'm uh, coming from the Center for Sustainable Chemical Technologies at the University of Bath, where we do a lot of research on renewable energy, trying to answer questions such as how can we power the future, how can we decarbonize our energy mix. Uh, and it's great to see so many of you here interested in the topic because it is a very important topic. Um, some say it's the most um, significant challenge that we have faced ever. Okay? Um, I can't promise to give you the answer to this question, okay? but what I thought I will do is to, um, from a few objective scientific basis, uh, lay out the challenges and show you some of the options that we have, how we might avoid a scenario like this and move towards a future more like that. Okay? So, as a background, maybe I don't think I need to show anyone these, uh, these numbers really in particular. I'm sure you've heard this before. If you just look at the energy mix, this is UK data. Don't mind the actual uh, units or numbers in here. Just look at the composition of what makes up uh, all the energy, where do we get the energy from at the moment uh, that we use in various applications. And then we will see, yes, we are increasing the amount of bioenergy and renewables. Um, I mean, this ends at 2015, and there has been a bit of uh, development in the area since, uh, well, until now. But still today, uh, it's around 85% of fossil resources, that is coal, coal, oil, and gas, okay? Now, we've all committed, we have all committed, the government has now committed um, to reduce CO2 emissions to basically a net zero by 2050, which is only about 30 years away. And so that basically means we'll have to bring this down as close to zero as possible. And the question is, how do we do this? How can we tackle this? Now, if you want to think about how you can decarbonize energy or get away from all these fossil fuels, you have to look at where all that energy is going. Where do we spend the energy? Where do we use it? And so... I've tried to give you an idea here. So this is um, an overview graphic. It's so-called a sector breakdown. Uh, again, don't mind the actual values or the numbers in here and just look at the percentages and the relative contributions. Um, this is data from the International Energy Agency, by the way, but this is a, a fair estimate for developed Western countries. So you can see that the biggest chunk of energy that we consume goes in so-called centralized large-scale power generation. Okay? This is the electricity that comes conveniently out of the sockets in our houses that we use um, to power all sorts of devices, uh, both domestic and centralized, so street lighting and so on, and is also largely used uh, for producing food. Okay? Then in the, in the purple bits here, you see everything that can be classified as transportation. Now you hear a lot uh, of talk about uh, greening up the car fleets and moving away from combustion engines. But if you look at it, you know, cars, which is called light road, they only make up about just over 10% of the overall energy that we use. So it's important that we do something about the combustion engines in cars which are polluting and contribute to CO2 emissions. But that's, that's not all there is, okay? Because there's significant heavy transportation that has just about as much impact. And there are also other industries or other sectors that consume lots of energy. And especially these ones here, all the ones shown in red, uh, are rarely talked about in public debates, okay? So this is all the industry, chemical industry, that happens in the background that supplies us with all the goods that we apparently cannot live without. Okay, so it's cement manufacturing, steel, aluminum, polymers, all these things that our modern world is made of. It all needs to come from somewhere. We need energy to make it, and that in itself consumes about as much energy as transportation, certainly more than the cars alone. Okay, and domestic use, you can see this up here in the yellow bits, it's actually a relatively small proportion. Okay, so that's heating in your house and, um, and cooking and so on. So I'm not saying you shouldn't use LEDs, okay? You shouldn't have your meat-free Mondays and you shouldn't carpool and use bicycles whenever you can instead of cars. But the key message from this, what I want you to take away, is that that alone won't be enough, okay? So most of the power is used in large central facilities, such as central power generation, industry, and heavy transportation. And we have to do something fundamental. We have to change fundamentally how these large-scale energy uh, sectors are powered if we want to avoid a collapse of the ecosystem of the Earth. Okay? Now, you might remember that thermodynamics tell us that energy can't be created or it cannot either be destroyed. We can only transform it into, from one form into another. Okay? We can move it around and change its, its shape and appearance. So we have to household with what we've got on this planet. Okay? Now, this is a graphic, again, that in relative terms, so the bubble sizes are relative to the percentages, um, you can contrast, so you can see what we have on one hand here on the right-hand side, the finite reserves of uh, fossil and nuclear fuels, okay, total reserves. 
And if you compare these to the annual world consumption, which is shown here in the middle, um, you can see we could, if we wanted to, live for another 50, perhaps 100 years um, of these finite reserves, because there's, there's quite a lot of them. Now, we don't want to do that because we've already created too much damage by using them excessively over the 200 years. The good news is that here on the left side, all the renewable forms of energy, uh, this, um, wave energy, geothermal, hydro, wind energy, and that big blot here is solar energy, there is loads of it. This is every year, okay? It's said, or it's estimated that in one hour, enough solar energy strikes the surface of the Earth to power the entire planet for a year. So, thermodynamically speaking, the good news is that we have lots of energy. We have lots of renewable energy. So certainly we have enough solar energy, okay? So these are on the table. These are viable options. We won't be limited by the availability of these. The problem is that these energies come in very different forms to what we are used to from the fossil fuels. One of the problems is that they're very dispersed <clears throat> and they're very diffuse, okay? So these three maps show a distribution of wind energy around the globe, uh, tidal energy, uh, and solar energy around the globe. And you can see there are areas that benefit a lot from solar energy, like Australia, uh, more so than others. And there are areas which have a lot of wind energy, so the north of uh, Russia, for instance, and here in South America. Um, and tidal energy, again, there are spots on the planet where we have loads of those. But these come very dilute, okay? So it's not like finding a coal mine or an oil well and then essentially pumping money out of the ground. Even in areas where you have lots of them, you still need to harvest them and, and concentrate them. And the other problem with them is that even if you have access to these and you can manage to harvest them, um, they don't, they're not available as um, fossil fuels are. Now, the sun shines when the sun shines, the wind blows when the wind blows, and the tide comes when it comes. Um, and we can't just um, you know, make energy appear when we want it. Okay? So although as an overall sum of energy, there is enough solar, wind, and tide energy, but the temporal distribution does not match any of the demand profiles of the domestic sector, of transportation, or of the industrial sector. Okay? So there's lots of it, but we somehow need to level it out and transform it into forms that we can use on demand. <clears throat> so that basically means we have to harvest a lot of that energy and transform it into something else. Okay? And this something else is uh, sometimes called fuels or energy carriers. There's different words of it. They all mean the same thing. Uh, and they entail taking the electricity that we get from, sorry, I should hold this up higher, uh, that we get from solar farms or wind parks and transform it into something else. Now, electricity is convenient um, to use and to transport, but it doesn't store very well. Now, there's lots of talks about battery technology these days. Okay? Batteries can store directly electric energies, voltages, that we get from these energy sources. But the problem is that batteries um, are not very efficient when it comes to storing a lot of energy in a small amount of space or volume. So here I've um, shown you the energy densities of a range of different energy carriers. So here are combustion fuels that we use. So this is diesel, gasoline, liquefied natural gas, ethanol, methanol, and some biomass on here. Down here we have hydrogen, which is often um, discussed as a future fuel or, or energy carrier. And then down here we've got batteries. So this is not the old lead sulfuric acid battery. These are state-of-the-art lithium ion batteries. So they're great because they can directly store electricity from renewables, and they will certainly play a very important role in certain sectors for mobile applications, you know, phones, laptops, small devices, perhaps even cars, we'll see. But they won't be enough to cover and satisfy all the different energy sectors. I mean, many people find it very hard to believe, including myself, that we will ever develop a battery technology that will be energy dense enough to fly an aeroplane on or to power a cement factory with. Okay? So we need something else. And just to illustrate this difference in energy density, um, here I've got um, a rhetorical hydrogen balloon. So the energy contained in this volume, if this was pure hydrogen, would be equivalent to a battery that is 300 times heavier than this. So this would be one gram of hydrogen. This would be a 300 gram lithium ion battery. And if this, the same amount of energy um, was transformed into diesel, it would be just five milliliters, about three grams. Okay? So three different forms of energy in very different weights and volumes. But that's not even everything, so that's complicated enough. But on top of the volume and the weight, there comes the question of you know, how expensive is it to store this hydrogen? How expensive or efficient is it to store this electricity? And how expensive is it to store and transport these fuels? Okay? So hydrogen is great for certain applications. 
Batteries are great for certain applications, but liquid fuels will be needed. And I think this aspect is often overlooked in these public debates that um, tend to focus on either batteries or hydrogen. Okay. Now, the problem why our society or our industry is so based on these liquid fuels is not only because they're so conveniently energy rich, but also because historically we used to directly get them from fossil fuels or fossil resources. So we can burn them directly to get power, we can transform them into or refine them into diesel and petrol, and we can make chemicals from them. But going forward, we shouldn't dig these out of the ground anymore and burn them um, simply for energy. We must reverse part of this process take this renewable power that we get from these options and turn it into something like this, okay? So we need to reverse this flow of energy. We need to collect renewable energy and transform it into some more dense form that we can use in our uh, society. And the key bit for doing this, hydrogen out of the way now, um, is a quite old technology called electrolysis, okay? Electrolysis is simply a means of converting electrical power or voltage or current flow um, putting that into an aqueous solution and applying a minimum voltage of 1.3 volts, and it would split the water into its constituents. So it would split it into hydrogen and oxygen. Now, the oxygen in this case uh, is the byproduct, it's the one that you don't need. So that can be vented or used for other things. But all the energy that comes from these renewable sources will be contained in the hydrogen that you make. Okay? So that hydrogen you could use for certain sectors, it's great for certain parts of the industry, it might even power certain applications but you can do lots of other things with it. Now, if we want to make this sort of the, the backbone of our energy society or energy conversion, then this process needs to be as efficient and as robust as possible, okay? Electrolyzers have been around for a long time, but efficiency has never been a primary concern, okay? But if we want to use it to turn electri uh, renewable electricity into a chemical fuel and then satisfy all the different sectors from there. We need very good electrocatalysts for doing this water splitting, and this is the only um, short plug for our own research. So we develop, uh, together with some other people, uh, electrocatalysts that you can put on the surface of the electrodes that increase the efficiency of the water splitting. So you have less losses going from here over the electrolysis into hydrogen uh, and other fuels from there. Now, to give you a flavor, um, or, or at least a range of some options that we can um, make molecules that we can synthesize if we have access to this renewable hydrogen. Um, look at these three reactions here. So this is the only bit of real chemistry that I'm showing you today, uh, so you can relax. Um, you can take that hydrogen, can react it with CO2 from the atmosphere or from any other point source that you have it, and you can synthesize methanol from it. Now, methanol already is a decent fuel. It's not as, de uh, as energy dense as diesel. If you want something like diesel, you can react it further and create oxymethylene ethers. And oxymethylene ethers are chemically pure compounds, synthetically manufactured, um, that are basically diesel. They have the same energy content as diesel. They burn very cleanly, and they can be used in combustion engines with little to no modification. Now, if you don't like diesel for whatever reason, you can do uh, related chemistry. You can take CO2 and hydrogen, uh, do what is called a reverse water gas shift reaction, uh, and uh, create carbon monoxide, which you can react further with hydrogen in what is called a fischer tropsch reaction, and you can make hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbons is, is gasoline or kerosene, okay? And that you can use directly for aeroplanes and for other mobile applications. Other people are even investigating using nitrogen-based um, fuels or energy carriers. And this is essentially the Haber-Bosch process. It's reacting nitrogen with hydrogen to make ammonia, which is another very energy-dense liquid fuel, which you can use to power fuel cells or even combustion engines. And the point about all of these is that this is chemistry, which we've done for decades on large scale. Okay? So the reactions, the catalysts, the reactors for all of these are available, we know exactly how to do this chemistry, we know exactly how these compounds behave and store, so this is readily available technology, which in principle we could power entirely with renewable energy via water splitting, making clean hydrogen. And if you do it this way, although they look like you know, the bad guys that got us into trouble in the first place, because they're only carrying the hydrogen that comes from the renewables, when they're burned again, there's no net CO2 release into the atmosphere, okay? Now, which of these will make the race and will be the answer, I can't tell you. There will be a, an expert workshop at the Royal Society in about two weeks to look at some of these options, but I'm convinced that some of this will feature in the future energy mix. Okay, so with this, thank you for your attention, and I think we've got time for questions, right? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Do you want a microphone? or? Yeah. Energy is not renewable. That's 
we know that. If we take the energy from the sun coming onto the planet, mm -hmm. the wind, and we turn those into electrical energy, yeah. um, what's the net effect on the planet? So oh, the yes. Wind, yeah. Do we alter the environment? Well, to some extent. So I'm not saying, well, I'm not going back to the slide. So yes, when, it, when I say renewable energy, I mean energy that is constantly coming in from the sun onto the planet. So overall, as a universe, the energy is constant, but on the planet, we have a net influx from the sun. So yes, and there is a thought if we take away some of the solar energy or the wind energy that we've got, that we disturb the ecosystem in other ways. Um, but if you think about the contribution, I mean, if you just take solar energy for, as an example, there is so much excess solar energy that is not directly used in the ecosystem. You know, we only need a percent or less of that to power our planet. So the effect of whatever it might affect things will be negligible. And I mean, it looks like, if you keep the distribution in mind, that we will use a mix of different renewable energy forms in different parts of the planet anyway. It will have to be managed. It will have a non-zero effect, but I'm convinced that it will be less than the effect of burning fossil fuels and unlocking CO2 into the atmosphere continuously. That's the best I can say about that at this point. OK. Um, yeah, OK. Uh, what's the net, net output of this process? So you have to first create electricity to mm -hmm. uh, do electrolysis. Yeah. And then you convert the, use the oxygen, I mean hydrogen. Yeah. Um, now, now, this is why this question is a little bit complex. So all this looks very feasible, but in every step, so in every conversion, so in harvesting solar energy or wind energy, you have a certain efficiency. You don't capture 100% all the photons or all the wind energy. So there's a certain loss associated here. There's a certain loss associated with the electrolysis, making the hydrogen, and then every other step down the way has a certain energy loss associated with it. So the final, say, we're making oxymethylene ethers as sustainable or renewable diesel. It will not be 100% renewable energy. It will only contain, I don't know, 30% or something. So this is what we have to do. We have to do a techno-economic analysis of all of these value chains and see which one is most promising, which one cons conserves most of the energy that we're putting in. Again, sorry, I can't give you a precise answer on this, but. Um, you have to lay out the facts and, and, and do the calculations. It's not that difficult because we have done almost each of these steps in different contexts already. So, you know, it's, it's quite scalable, but we just have to sit down and neutrally look at the facts and, and do that. And this is what the workshop will be about in two weeks. Yeah. So you talk about uh, using an intermittent energy source to generate um, a fuel vector. Why, why don't you use a baseload energy source that's renewable, like nuclear, where you use fast reactors and plutonium and other so the intermittency that I showed in the diffusivity, that applies primarily to solar wind and wave. Yeah. Um, so geothermal, for instance, is much more stable, yeah. but there's also a lot less of it. Yes. Okay, so that, it will factor into the mix, but it won't nearly be as important as these three. Okay? Nuclear is another one. I personally don't view nuclear as renewable or green or sustainable energy, because you're consuming a finite resource and you're creating a waste. And you know, from a purely scientific point of view, it might be okay to use it as a translation or a step in between from fossil to fully renewable. Um, but it's not a very popular topic, it's okay? Hmm? It is in my part. Well, <laughs> okay. I mean, it might be okay, but, um, you know, and, and, and it served us well. But, you know, in the long term, let's say, we'll have to use some of those. I mean, it, it could be an, an intermediate solution. Yeah? Mechanically, so. Oh, mechanically? Yeah. Um, say by pumping water yeah. and then using it for hydroelectricity. Yes. Demand. Yeah. Switzerland has done this, for instance. So whenever you have big dams, for instance, you can simply run them in the reverse and you store energy which you have surplus during, you know, on a sunny day to pump water back up. And then in the night, you just let it flow down again and you cover it. Um, again, there are techno-economic studies on these and they are viable in certain spots but not universally viable as something like a, uh, a chemical fuel. 
Um, and again, this is only for the sector of central power generation, which is admittedly one of the largest ones, but for transportation, for instance, that, that wouldn't do it. Um, how much it will feature in the future energy mix, I can't say. Um, you know, if you have a dam, you would do it locally. But if you don't, I don't think you would build one for it. One more? Yes? Okay. We're allowed one more question. I'll just ask off the cuff. Okay. Are you likely to see any wind turbines for domestic properties? Because we've got solar coming up, up everywhere. So yeah. Certain areas that get a lot more wind, then we don't get sun. Um, and sun's not all year round and wind can be all year round. Is there anything in the pipeline for that? So, so this complicates the whole picture further. So I think with a move towards more renewable energy, we'll also see a decentralization of some of these sectors. Now, that can't happen immediately. We can't say suddenly, OK, everyone, you go and make your own power. Here's a solar panel. Here's a wind turbine. That won't work. But there will be a larger degree of individual small-scale power generation. And I don't see why not. We, why people wouldn't have you know, a wind turbine in the back of their yard if if there is enough wind, just as people have solar panels on their houses already. So yeah, that will, that will happen to some degree. Okay, I'm still available for further questions and discussions outside probably after this. Okay, thank you. Thank you.